Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And I just wanted to thank Pat and Circa for giving me the opportunity to speak as part of my doctoral degree. And uh, it's a great opportunity. So as Pat mentioned today, I'd like to talk to you about some unique applications of preference assessments, uh, structured preference assessments particularly. And this presentation largely emerged out of my own practice in that each of the case presentations I'm going to talk about a little bit later emerged because there was some sort of problem or some sort of question that I had that I couldn't quite answer with the, with the methods that I currently had. Um, so decided to apply a structured preference assessment in a way that maybe I had hadn't used it before in a sort of a, in a new way. So my hope is that from this presentation, um, you'll get some practical information that might be helpful, but also that it might kind of spur you to think about different ways that you might be able to use structured preference assessments to answer other questions that you have in your practice. I'm sure that um, you all encounter questions that are difficult to answer in the same manner that I do. Just to give you an idea of what the presentation will look like today. We're going to start, as Pat mentioned, with a brief overview of stimulus preference assessments. We're not going to do an exhaustive overview. We're just going to focus in on the ones that are most relevant to the case presentations I'm going to talk about. And I'll provide some resources towards the end if anybody is interested in more in-depth information about preference assessments in general. Um, so we're going to go over the multiple stimulus without replacement assessment, the paired stimulus assessment, and the free operant assessment. And then once we've done a brief review of those, we'll move into each of the case presentations. And I won't read all those out because we'll go into them in more detail. Before we continue, I just wanted to pose a few questions for everyone to think about as we're going through the presentation. Um, these are the types of questions that we often think about when designing treatments for individuals with developmental disabilities. We'll come back to them throughout the, um, throughout the presentation, probably about midway through and then towards the end. So if you can, I'd like you to think about um, when it might be important to know someone's preferences, in, particularly with respect to the people that you work with, um, when it's important to know what they like and don't like, um, and some ways that we commonly find out about an individual's preferences, and whether there are situations for you as there were for me where sometimes the ways we typically get that information may not be as effective or may not give us the information we need to design treatment programs. So just kind of keep those in your mind as we're moving through. So there's three general categories of structured methods we might use to find out about an individual's preferences. The first are indirect methods. Um, so these might be questionnaires, interviews, those types of things. Um, and they're generally designed to get preliminary information that can be used in a later structured preference assessment. Then structured preference assessments, which is going to be the focus of this um, presentation, are designed to assess an individual's preference for items and give us an, a hierarchy of preferred items. And the important thing to note is that in preference assessments or structured preference assessments, the information we gather is about what that person likes and doesn't like, not whether those items will actually function as reinforcers. That information can be gathered from a reinforcer assessment. We're not going to talk in depth about those today at all, but I wanted to mention them, mention them primarily because each of the different preference assessments we're going to talk about today have been validated through the use of a reinforcer assessment. In a reinforcer assessment, the reinforcing um, effectiveness of the items is directly assessed by seeing what their effect on behavior is. I mentioned that some examples of uh, indirect assessments might include uh, interviews. So this is the reinforcer assessment for individuals with severe disabilities. I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of it in case you haven't seen it before or something similar before. And it is a structured interview that would be carried out in a back and forth manner with a caregiver. And um, you can see the first couple of questions there. So there's questions like um, you know, asking questions about the types of things a child likes to look at, the types of things they like to listen to, gathering information about overall kind of categories of stimuli that the person might like or dislike. This information that we gather from these, these, these inter this type of interview could then be used to design a structured preference assessment. So as I mentioned, the structured preference assessments provide us with information about what items, foods, or activities someone likes or dislikes. Um, and conducting a structured preference assessment typically involves presenting stimuli in a systematic way and then observing how often the person either selects each item or how much time they spend engaged with those items. So thinking about um, uh, selection-based assessments, so these would be assessments where we're observing how often the individual selects each of the different items. In these types of assessments, the stimuli are presented um, most often in pairs or in an array. Not always, there are single stimulus assessments. 
And then we simply measure how often the individual selects or approaches those um, specific items. And there's a few different examples there. We'll talk in more detail about the multiple stimulus and paired stimulus. Engagement-based or duration-based assessments, on the other hand, involve presenting either a single item or an array of items, and then measuring the duration of engagement with those items. So we're looking at the time spent engaged versus how often it's selected. So as I mentioned today, we're going to focus on two selection-based assessments, the multiple stimulus without replacement and the paired choice or paired stimulus assessment. And then we're going to look at one engagement-based assessment, which is the free operant stimulus preference assessment. We're going to start with the multiple stimulus without replacement. So in this assessment, we typically can assess six to eight different items. When we conduct the assessment, we present an array of six to eight items, ask the individual to select their favorite one, um, give them some time to consume the item if it's food, or play with or manipulate the item if it's an object, and then the items will be rearranged and a new trial would be presented. And we just continue this process until each item had been selected. So essentially, each time the person makes a selection, one item is removed and it's not replaced, and that's why it's called a without replacement assessment. Um, and not, the other termination criteria would be if 30 seconds passes and the person doesn't select anything, clearly nothing that's left is good enough, so we would move on at that point. There's two commonly used types of multiple stimulus without replacement assessments. There's a full MSWO um, in which five array presentations occur. So in a full MSWO, the array is presented five times and that means that that whole process of presenting six to eight items, letting the person select one at a time until they're all gone, would be carried out five times and the data from those five assessments would be combined to produce a hierarchy of preferred items. The only difference with the brief multiple stimulus without replacement assessment is that process is only carried out three times. So it's briefer because you're only doing the, that process three times. And both of these have been demonstrated to be effective ways to identify preferred items. So most commonly the brief MSWO is used in practice, I should say. So I'm just going to show you a quick video. Um, the first three videos that I'm going to show you come from uh, publicly available online training resources through Vanderbilt University. They're available on YouTube, so if anybody is interested in using them uh, or seeing, viewing them again, that's where you can access them. Can't adjust this up. Good when thinking about using an MSWO. Um, it is a relatively brief assessment, so that's a benefit, um, particularly if you do a brief MSWO. It is likely to produce a hierarchy of preferred items, and by that I mean we're likely to get information about um, an individual's preferences for a number of different items, as opposed to them just manipulating a single item and really only having information about that one item. Um, one thing to note, and this video gave a nice little minor example of that, is that it's not appropriate for individuals who have a history of tangibly maintained problem behavior. So if uh, the individual frequently has a history of engaging in problem behavior when preferred items are removed, it wouldn't be appropriate because um, we're essentially repeatedly preventing, <laughs> presenting items and removing them. Um, and there are other types of assessments that we can use. And you know, this was just a little bit of protest, but it gives you a bit of an idea of why that can, we can run into that problem. Another potential um, problem can be um, is that pos positional bias can be observed. So you know because we put the items out in an array, it's possible that the child could or the person could just select, um, always select the item on the left or always select the item on the right, for example, or any other position 
in the array. And again, there are solutions to that that uh, we can talk about. Another consideration is that it's most appropriate when you're assessing smaller items or a fewer number of items. And that's just simply related to the logistics of presenting everything in an array on the table. You can only fit so many things on the table and they can only be so large. So we're now going to talk about another selection-based assessment, the Parrot Stimulus Assessment. So in this assessment, we can assess uh, 8 to 16 different items, typically. You could assess more items than that, but the more items you add, uh, the lengthier the, the assessment gets. And 16 items is kind of about, about as much as is typically done in the research or in the literature. Um, so when we're conducting this assessment, we present two items at a time. So instead of presenting all the items together, we're just presenting two at a time. Let the individual select their favorite of those two, and then provide them with an opportunity to consume it if it's food, play with it if it's a toy, and present a new trial. And we just continue this process until each item that's being assessed has been paired with each other item at least one time. Bye, Every time I play this video, I have that song in my head for the rest of the stimulus you provide about 30 seconds of access. <laughs> this is a much lengthy, lengthier access than uh, you typically do but that may have something to do with the individual client's characteristics. They do present more trials. I just want you to see another one or two. with the paired stimulus assessment as well. So as you can see in this video, they were able to present larger items or toys that would have been more difficult to present in an MSWO. So that's one of the benefits. Um, you can also assess a larger number of items. So um, with the MSWO, typically we would assess six to eight items at a time in one assessment. With a paired stimulus, you could um, assess up to 16 items. So we can assess at a larger number. Like the MSWO, it is uh, likely to produce a hierarchy of preferred items. Um, it can also be useful in rapport building. So for those of you working in early intervention, for example, um, if you're just starting assessment with someone, um, essentially when you're carrying out a paired stimulus, you're spending an, a pretty extended period of time repeatedly presenting preferred items to the individual. And, and you, so you potentially have the opportunity to both condition yourself up as a more preferred um, person, but also get some really great information while you're doing it about what items that individual prefers the most. Similar to the MSWO, we can see a positional bias, so they might just select the item on the left or the right. And it can be a little bit more time consuming. This largely depends on how many items you assess, though. So if you assess eight items in a full MSWO, the, duration, the time it takes to complete that assessment might be similar to eight items in a paired stimulus. But if you're assessing 16 items in a paired stimulus, it could be much more lengthy. Um, and often when that happens, when we're assessing more items, we would just break the assessment up into a few different sittings. It doesn't have to be all conducted at once. So now that we've talked about those two um, selection-based uh, assessments, we're going to move into the free operant assessment, which is an engagement-based assessment. 
Most commonly in a free operant assessment, you would assess somewhere around 10 to 11 items. You really could assess any number of items. Um, it's just that the more items you assess, the, the busier the space gets. Um, and most commonly in the literature, it's around 10 to 11 items that are assessed. So in a free operant assessment, all items are presented at the same time and the person has free access to everything in the room. Uh, they engage with the items according to their preference and we simply um, record um, how much they engage with each of the items. And this just continues until the session time is complete. Um, typically, uh, free operant assessments run anywhere from five minutes to 30 minutes, depending on the individual and the purpose and the situation. So this is a video of what a free operant assessment might look at. And what I'd like you to just pay attention to in this video is which item he spends the most time manipulating. It'll be very obvious because they actually track the manipulation time on the screen, so <laughs> you don't have to pay too much attention, but. Operant that the adult would not be engaging with the participant or the child at all. on fairly similar to this for the remainder, so I'll just, we'll move along to the next slide. One of the benefits, as you can see from watching that with a free operant assessment, is that preferred items are not repeatedly removed. So this is one of the assessments that is really useful if you have an individual who engages in problem behavior when preferred items are removed. It is fairly efficient, so if you conducted a five minute assessment with six to eight items, for example, you'd get quite a bit of information in a relatively short period of time. It also accommodates larger items. Um, so I've carried out free operant assessments where we've included things like, we're in a big room and we've included things like a scooter and a DVD player and those types of things. Um, and then in that case, instead of putting items on a table, we just arrange them in a circle on the floor for the individual to access. Another benefit is that you can, with a free operant assessment, you can carry out a competing items assessment. And we're going to talk in more detail about that later, but essentially what that entails is measuring both engagement with objects, but also the amount of stereotypic behavior or repetitive behavior an individual engages in while they're manipulating the objects. With the goal of identifying items or toys that are both really preferred for the individual, but also are associated with low levels of stereotypy. One of the potential challenges with a free operant stimulus preference assessment is that it can be less likely to produce a hierarchy of stimuli. So um, you'll notice in the video we just watched, which item did he manipulate most? The phone. So, and I, th I believe, I didn't watch right to the very end of the video, but he pretty much sticks with the phone for most of the rest of the video. Um, so if you compare that to the MSWO assessment that we observed, or that we watched the video for, they used the same stimuli, and he selected the phone first, but then once he selected the phone, we also got information about the relative preference for the remaining items. And in this video, um, the data from this free operant assessment may primarily give us information about the phone, that he really, really likes the phone. Um, so that doesn't always happen. It very often doesn't happen, but it's, it's something that can potentially happen in a free operant assessment. And in that case, another type of assessment might be effective or another solution that I've used is um, just simply removing that item and carrying out the free operant assessment again. And then you may get more varied allocation of responding to different types of stimuli. Before we move into the case presentations, which is where we're going to spend most of our time, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the common uses of structured preference assessments. Um, so most commonly, we use structured preference assessments to identify reinforcers or potential reinforcers for teaching new skills or for reducing problem behaviors or increasing alternative or desirable behaviors. 
We less commonly use preference assessments for things like identifying instructional targets, helping determine what environments an individual will spend their time in, and those types of things, which is what we're going to talk more about today, some alternative uses of preference assessments. So we're now going to move into these three case presentations. First, we're going to talk about using a preference assessment to select targets when treating food selectivity. Then we'll move on to selecting community and vocational settings. And finally, we'll look at identifying um, items to compete with engagement and stereotypy. So I just wanted to come back to these questions that I posed at the beginning of the presentation. So I've described a number of different ways that we can find out information about a person's preferences. And in the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to describe these uh, ways I've used these types of assessments in practice. So in each case, as I mentioned earlier, we found that the methods we typically use to find out information about an individual's preference were, preferences were not um, providing enough information. So for the remainder of the presentation, I'd just like you to think about whether there are places in your practice um, that you either have used structured preference assessments to answer those types of questions or where you think that that might be helpful. I didn't mention at the beginning, if anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to jump in, that's okay, or prefer them at the end. Either way is okay for me, so if you have any questions or comments, please jump in. So across the three uh, case presentations I'm going to talk about today, the goal is really to increase client self-advocacy with treatment selection and it, via their input into our treatment procedures and um, our treatment targets. So we're, for selecting the foods that we're going to target in expanding food repertoires, providing input into what community and vocational settings are their most preferred settings, and selecting preferred items for use in treatment. We're going to move into selecting targets when treating food selectivity. So um, the individual involved in this case presentation is a teenage male with ASD, or was a teenage male, he's now an adult, um, and he resided in an ABA or Applied Behavior Analysis teaching home. Um, and he typically spoke in three to five word sentences and read at a grade two to three level. So he could communicate verbally but had some difficulty communicating his, um, his preferences verbally. I just wanted to provide a quick note that um, Sharon Baxter, who's a co-director of Samyamu Behavior Analysts, Inc., and I worked together to develop and implement all of these. Hi. No, no worries. Come on in. Um, to develop and implement all these assessments. So I'm, uh, this assessment and the next presentation I'm going to show, which is with the same individual. Um, and I'm really thankful to have had the opportunity to work with her and have her supervision and direction in, in working with those, that client. So um, the problem for this individual was that he had some limited food repertoires. So he uh, had a limited number of vegetables that he consumed, a very narrow range. Um, there were a limited number of proteins he consumed. Um, and he also had a small number of healthy snacks. Most of his snacks were um, of the less healthy variety. And so something that's really important to note about him, though, is that he was willing to accept a taste of pretty much any non-preferred food. He just didn't choose to eat them on a regular basis. And so, um, and didn't, we, we hadn't tried at this point asking him to eat large quantities beyond a taste. So we wanted to get there where he could incorporate some more healthy foods into his diet on a regular basis. So I just wanted to really emphasize that this is an individual who does not have food refusal. This is someone who just has a narrow range of foods they eat. So this type of assessment wouldn't be appropriate when dealing with more severe food refusal. Um, you know, there's a lot of other medical considerations with food refusal, but also if you present a bunch of stimuli for him to choose from and the student is not willing to even taste the items, the assessment will be done in 30 seconds because he won't select anything. So um, that's just kind of the disclaimer for this one. So our overall goal for this, uh, for this case was to increase the variety of vegetables consumed on a daily and weekly basis and then later to increase the variety of proteins as well as healthy snacks. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about how we might, some other ways we might typically select treatment targets when we're treating food selectivity like this. Often we would take into consideration the caregiver's preference um, and the availability of foods. And that makes sense and is an important consideration because um, it makes sense that if we're going to teach an individual to eat new foods, that they're learning to eat new foods that are in their family's home um, and that the other people around them like to eat. 
We also might um, consider the types of foods the person already consumes and take sort of our best guess about what other foods that are similar to those they'd be most likely to consume. So something that has a similar texture to foods he already likes, things that have a similar taste or flavor to foods that he already likes. <clears throat> so those are things we took into consideration. Um, so why use also use a structured preference assessment? For us, the goal was to get to allow the client's preference to inform the sequence of targets. So if we're going to teach him to accept new foods, why not start with, of the foods that he doesn't like, start with the ones that he hates the least or the ones he likes the most of those ones, and then through the preference assessment, use that hierarchy to inform the sequence of targets. So we opted to use a multiple stimulus without replacement assessment, um, and we conducted MSWOs for, to identify targets for increasing the variety of vegetables he ate, the variety of healthy proteins, and the variety of healthy snack options. The MSWOs were run by the program supervisor of the teaching home who, had, uh, who was either a master's student in applied behavior analysis or a related discipline. We had a couple of different supervisors at different times. Before we move into a little video, I just wanted to show you a sample of what a data collection sheet might look like. So, oh, look at that, it works. Um, so this part down here at the bottom, where you see stimuli, this would mirror the presentation of the stimuli on the table. So we would first enter the items we're going to assess, so this might be um, raw carrots, cooked carrots, broccoli, and so on. And then we would enter those numbers, one through eight, across the top of the data collection sheet. Once the individual had selected an item, we would circle whichever item they selected and then write in the numbers in the same way we're going to present the stimuli for the next trial and continue that all the way through. And um, <clears throat> we would conduct for a brief MSWO, this whole array would be presented three times. So we'd have three sets of data that would then be combined and totaled up here. Just to give you an idea. So this is a video of the MSWO for vegetables. Um, and as you'll see, um, he is willing to taste everything. He's an expert at taking teeny tiny bites, <laughs> but that's just fine because we're just trying to find out uh, what his preferences are. Um, and I'll just, we're coming in partway through the assessment. So he's already made a couple of selections and we're partway through the assessment now. Somebody's having fun out there. The video gets better in just a couple seconds. Teeny tiny bite. I should note, he knows what all of these items are. He has tasted them all before, so he knows what he's choosing at this point. And there were eight items assessed, so we're now down into the bottom four, so waiting a little bit longer before making his selections. Okay. So, I'm going to show you the graphs from uh, some of these assessments. I didn't know before that video started, and I should have, um, I have permission from all of the families to share both the data and the um, and the videos that I'm sharing today. So um, this is the assessment for uh, vegetables. And you can see along the y-axis, we have percentage of trials selected. Along the x-axis, we have um, the different types of foods. And something to note is that in a typical MSWO where you're assessing preferred items, we would expect to see a number, some of the items at least being up here. And most of these items are in the lower half, which is not surprising because these are all relatively non-preferred things. 
Um, so you can see that cooked carrots was the most preferred. Raw carrots were the next most preferred, followed by raw celery, cooked mushrooms, raw mushrooms, raw spinach, cooked broccoli, and raw broccoli down at the bottom. Um, so based on this information, we started, um, working, started with working on eating more cooked carrots and raw carrots. And then once he was successfully incorporating those into his regular diet, we moved on to celery and so on, down through the hierarchy. This is the graph for the protein assessment. This is my favorite graph because Nana's stew is on the graph, which is fantastic. Um, and I tell, I've had Nana's stew, it is good stew. It's not surprising to me that it's preferred. So, you can see along the x-axis we have percentage of trials selected and on the y, or sorry, the y-axis, percentage of trials selected, on the x-axis the food again. So Nana's stew was the most preferred, and this was preferred enough that we didn't need to target this. We just, he just started, he just ate it. Um, we then moved on to cheddar cheese, and I think where we actually started instruction was with hard-boiled egg, because that was the first one that was um, relatively less preferred, followed by bacon, chicken, steak, fish, and hamburger. So just to give you an idea of how caregiver, the caregiver's um, input was incorporated into this, basically the way we, create, we selected the items we were going to assess was based on the availability of food and the caregiver's, in, the caregiver's preferences for what their child consume. And then based on that, we took those items and assessed them in the preference. So it was a nice way to be able to integrate those two pieces. This is the healthy snacks assessment. This assessment is a little bit different because there were more items assessed here that he just hadn't tried before, that we just hadn't exposed him to. So that's another possible use of this type of assessment. So you'll see that Greek yogurt, as it turns out, he loves it, <laughs> which isn't surprising because one of his other favorite foods is goat cheese. So um, Greek yogurt is super preferred, so we didn't, need, again, didn't need to teach that. Tuna and crackers was relatively preferred. Um, carrots and dip, avocado, salmon and crackers, salsa and chips and cottage cheese down at the bottom. So it gave us some good information that we didn't need to teach some things, which is great, and then gave us information about where to start our instruction. And this Healthy Snacks one was um, conducted fairly recently. It was a more recent assessment. So as I mentioned, in terms of how this influenced our treatment decisions, we started with the most preferred foods or sort of the least dis disliked foods. And then we systematically introduced foods in a hierarchy. So one question that could be asked is whether there were facilitative effects of early success with the higher preference foods. We don't know. That's a great empirical question. <laughs> um, uh, but it's definitely a possibility. It's something that would be interesting to look at. So some considerations when using an MSWO in this way. Um, the individual should have prerequisite skills, including sitting and attending for short durations, following simple directions, choosing from an array of options. They must also be willing to taste, at least taste some items in the array. Um, as I mentioned before, if they aren't, then the assessment will be pretty much moot because it'll be over very quickly. Now I'm gonna move into um, using a preference assessment to select community and vocational settings. Um, so this assessment was actually carried out with the same individual a few years later. So he is now an adult, still living in an ABA teaching home. And he now has access and is successful in an, a huge number of community settings. I think actually in our most recent um, sort of quarterly report, there were 95 different settings that he was accessing in the community. So he is a busy, busy guy. Um, we ran into problems with how to help him allocate his time. There's so many places he's successful in. How do we determine how to make the schedule and how to make sure that he's getting access to all of the settings that are important to him? Um, so the other, the other piece is that because he's successful in a number of different situations now, we're really focusing on teaching problem solving skills and increasing his independence in the different settings. And we kind of had to figure out where to focus that instruction. So if we're going to focus on increasing independence and problem solving skills, it makes sense to focus that in the settings that he likes being in the most and that are most uh, important to him. So uh, again, I'd like to just touch on some common approaches we might have to selecting community settings. Often we, of course, would get caregiver and staff input about what the individual's preferences seem to be. So which settings do they seem the happiest in? Which settings do they frequently request access to or otherwise indicate they'd like to access? Um, we also would probably take into consideration the preferences of those that are important to the individual. So his parents, this, his staff members, his family, his friends. Um, Again, because it makes sense that he, we help him be successful in the settings that are, that are important to those that are around him. 
um, another thing that often comes into play, as all of us know, is logistics. So what staffing is like, what resources are available, um, and what existing relationships we have with community partners. So those are all things that come to influence what community settings we choose to, have the, to help the individual access. But what we wanted to do was get his input into what settings we were going to access. So um, the goal for us was to determine which community settings were most important to him so that we could focus his time and energy and any instruction we were doing in those settings. What we decided to do was a video-based paired stimulus assessment. Now, a video-based paired stimulus assessment is very similar to the stimulus preference assessment we talked about earlier, the paired stimulus assessment, except that instead of presenting two items, we're presenting two videos for the individual to choose from. So when we were deciding what type of assessment method would be appropriate, we considered whether pictures or videos would be most appropriate. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any research yet that's directly comparing pictures and videos, but each of them have individually been demonstrated to be effective ways to assess preferences. So we decided to go with videos because we felt that that might present more salient stimuli and would more closely approximate what his experience was when he was in those settings, particularly because we had videos of him engaging in activities in those settings. So um, the next question we had was whether once he selected that setting, we needed to provide immediate access to it. So as you'll recall, with a typical paired stimulus assessment, once the person selects an item, they get access to that item for a period of time. You can imagine the difficulty of providing access to bike riding or running or the museum immediately after selection. So luckily, someone has evaluated whether immediate access to the stimuli is necessary. So Clark, Donaldson, and Kong um, conducted a video-based preference assessment. So they first identified classes of stimuli the individual was likely to enjoy based on caregiver report. And then they created videos of an unfamiliar person engaging with items. So someone playing with the music toy, someone pressing buttons on this toy. And then they created those videos and carried out a video-based assessment and they did not provide access to the item after the person made a selection. And they found that items identified as preferred with that assessment did in fact function as reinforcers when they were evaluated in a reinforcer assessment. So this gave us um, enough information that we were comfortable proceeding with a video-based assessment that did not, um, where we didn't provide access to the stimuli. Thank goodness, I don't know how we would have done that. To create this video-based uh, paired stimulus assessment, we selected a sample of nine community settings to assess. So as I mentioned, there's many, many more settings that he assesses, but because this was the first time we conducted this type of assessment with him, and there are, there's a decent amount of time and resources involved in conducting this assessment, we wanted to start with a smaller number to reduce the time and effort involved in assessing it, make sure it was a really good assessment for him and we got good information, and later on we'll assess more, do a more in-depth assessment of more different settings. So we collected short video clips of the client in each setting. They were, about they were all 15 seconds each. And then we created a PowerPoint presentation. So each video was paired with each other video one time. And the data collection sheet will actually be, make it a bit easier to understand what that looked like. So um, you can see that we have L for left, R for right. So this is trial one. Hike would be presented on the left side of the screen, gym on the right side of the screen. Trial two, the museum on the left, hospital volunteering video on the right. And each trial would be one slide in the PowerPoint presentation. And so we just created a presentation that mirrored the data sheet, and this is a sample of the data sheet. And then as the assessment was conducted, um, the person conducting the assessment would just circle which item was selected on the data sheet. So we used some procedures similar to the Clark et al. study that I mentioned. So we would present the slide, play the video on the left, for uh, um, it's 15 seconds, so play the video on the left, followed by playing the video on the right, play them both simultaneously and ask him to choose which one was his favorite. And he selected videos by pointing to the screen on the computer. And then we presented the next slide. And we just continued that until the assessment was complete. We had expected to have to break this up uh, into three or four sittings, but we actually only broke it into two settings because he really enjoyed this assessment. He was super, super into the videos and watching them and making choices. So that was a really nice collateral benefit for us that he, he liked it. So we know we can use this um, without any problems in the future. So what I'm going to show you now is not actually a video of him taking, 
participating in the assessment because it would be hard for you to see what the screen looked like and I think that's the most important piece right now. Um, so this is actually just a screencast of my screen with the presentation playing and you'll hear me, a voiceover of me presenting trials and you'll see sort of like a fake circle select the item. Um, this was my introduction to the Camtasia software that UBC offers for students for free. So if anybody else is interested, it was really easy to figure out. This is at the museum. You'll hear the birds in the background. This is volunteering at the hospital. There are a number of different jobs he does there. This is just one of them. This is hiking. Note his face at the end of this video and compare that to the data that I show you. <laughs> Interesting. It may have just been sunny, but. <laughs> this is um, a job he has at the YMCA. He's cleaning all the equipment. Everybody thinks that the backpack vacuum is the best thing ever. We all wish we could use it. I'll just show you one more slide and then we'll move on. So this is delivering newspapers, and then the hospital is on the right again. Um, this, is, this graph is set up very similar to, similarly to the other ones, and you'll see uh, the items we assessed included bike riding, swimming, newspaper delivery, museum, hospital volunteering, his job at the YMCA, going to the gym, running, and hiking. And I asked you to look at his face, and hike, hiking came out at the bottom. <laughs> at the bottom of these items, there's a lot of, of course, different activities he accesses. So in terms of how this uh, influenced our treatment decisions, um, we are still, we just recently conducted this assessment, so we're still in the process of incorporating the results into his uh, treatment plan. One of the things that was uh, of note for us is that bike riding came out as the number one most preferred activity. Um, as you can imagine, bike riding does present some safety concerns. This individual has, uh, does have some history of elopement and uh, just does not have the um, safety awareness to ride his bike on the road. Um, however, there is a paved trail close to his home where he, or actually it's not super close to his home, but in his community that um, he can uh, ride his bike on that's enclosed and is safe. Um, because it is a bit of a drive away from his home though, he doesn't get to access it super frequently. So one of the things that came out of this assessment is bike riding is his most preferred activity. So we, we got to find a way for him to access that a little bit more often. 
So we're looking at increasing the access um, in terms of the frequency he goes and just finding a way to build it into the schedule more frequently. And then also investigating whether there's some other safe options for bike riding. Maybe there are some other trails, some other places he could ride his bike in the community that would be safe, that wouldn't be on the roads. And um, that's a good example of there's, there's a fairly high response effort involved to make it happen. And if we didn't know this was his most, most preferred community activity, we might not put that effort in. And we might choose to let him access something else. Um, so another thing that's interesting is anecdotally, we would have predicted, just based on sort of what everybody thought, we would have predicted that the YMCA would be his most preferred vocational setting or pre-vocational setting. And in actual fact, newspaper delivery was the most preferred, followed by his hospital volunteer setting and the YMCA in terms of the, um, the pre-vocational settings. Another thing that's interesting is not that long ago, we had reports that he seemed very, he seemed to really dislike the newspaper delivery. He was bored with it. Um, and it turns out that it's, it's still one of his more preferred um, settings. So um, it's, it's possible that without anybody realizing that it was happening, that other people's preferences were influencing their perception of the client's preferences. And I think that's one of the reasons that something like this is quite valuable, because it helps us, we all do it, totally unintentionally, um, and this helps us kind of weed that out and make sure that we're really looking at what the individual prefers. Um, one of the things that we're also thinking about going forward, particularly with respect to vocational settings, is trying to look at um, conducting assessments of places he already accesses, and then seeing if we can identify if there's any common characteristics to the more preferred ones. And if there are, we might be able to look for other job settings that have those common characteristics that might mean that they would be more preferred as well. So that's sort of the coming down, the, the to come part of the influence of this data on our decisions. The first time I had conducted a video-based assessment, so there's lots of different things that um, I thought would be good to communicate to everyone in case you might like to use something like this. So the first consideration is how many things to assess. Uh, I mentioned we chose nine because we want it to be a relatively brief assessment. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is just the more videos or the more settings you assess, the more videos you need to collect. It'll take a little bit longer to create the assessment and then a little bit longer to conduct the assessment. So that just depends on um, what the available resources and time are. Um, there's a number of things to consider with respect to the videos themselves. So the first is logistics. Who will collect the videos? Um, using a consistent device. So we started by some of the videos being on an iPhone, some of them being on a camera, and then those videos were different sizes and it was very difficult. So we ended up just sending the, cam uh, the same camera out to get videos on the same device. So that's a very little logistical thing, but it actually did, uh, it, would, it will save you a lot of time if you <laughs> take that into consideration. Um, we, had, we were lucky in that it was easy for us to collect the videos. We could just send a camera out with the staff when they went with the client to that location, they could collect the video. That might not be the case in every setting. So in another context, it might make more sense for one person to be responsible for collecting videos. They go out and get videos of each of those settings. And that's where having videos that the client is not in might be more practical. Um, the, the other considerations with respect to content, we already talked about whether the client or another person is in the video. Um, based on the information that I have, I think either would be okay. Um, we decided, like I said, to include the client because it was easy to do. Um, another thing to consider is whether the client has prior access to that setting. So everything we assessed, uh, all the settings we assessed were ones that the individual had extensive experience with. Um, over a long period of time. So he was very familiar with those settings. Um, this might not be necessary though, and it would be potentially useful, for example, to conduct a video-based assessment when trying to find new settings for the individual to go into. And so it would, be, it would be good to know whether, if the person's never been to that setting, a video-based assessment could provide um, good information. And that's a question I don't have an answer to. Another good question that could be answered. Sorry, the final consideration is um, prerequisite skills with respect to video to picture matching. So in the Clark et al. study, they did carry out a pre-experimental assessment where they, uh, they evaluated to see if the individual could match pictures to videos that were presented. Um, we did not carry that assessment out because we were, we were confident that our client possessed that skill and it turned out he did. It all worked out fine. Um, but that would be something to consider either before you go in to do an assessment like this, if you um, if you're unsure as to whether that uh, capability exists, 
or if you conduct an assessment and you're not sure that the results are, you're not getting results that are useful, you might want to go back and look at that. And in that case, using pictures might be more appropriate than, excuse me, than videos. So we're going to move into the identifying leisure items to compete with stereotypy um, case presentation. So this is kind of half case presentation, half um, some information from my master's uh, thesis. So stereotypy can be defined uh, as uh, repetitive or non-functional movements or vocalization. It's not always, but it's most often maintained by automatic reinforcement. Um, and by automatic reinforcement, I mean that engagement in the uh, in stereotypy produces the reinforcer. So, so for example, if I flap my hand in front of my face, the act of flapping my hand produces the visual stimulus of that hand flapping in front of my face, regardless of anything else that's going on in the environment. Um, so that's what we mean by automatic reinforcement. So as I mentioned, not all stereotypy is automatically maintained, but for the purposes of this presentation and non-contingent reinforcement, which is what we're going to talk about today, um, we're going to talk exclusively about um, automatically maintained stereotypy. So there are a lot of different types of interventions um, that, de that can be used to decrease stereotypy and that have been shown to be effective in decreasing stereotypy. Many of these, however, are relatively time intensive and many also require continuous monitoring of the person. Um, and so, for example, uh, in the case of response interruption and redirection, which involves uh, observing the individual engaged in stereotypy, interrupting it, and redirecting it to uh, an appropriate alternative behavior, that requires that the person be able to monitor um, the individual continuously and intervene on every event of stereotypy. In some cases, that may be possible and may be a good treatment option, but in other cases, when continuous monitoring isn't possible, that might not be the best, the best um, treatment selection. So one alternative when continuous monitoring isn't possible is the use of non-contingent reinforcement. And non-contingent reinforcement involves um, continue, providing continuous access to items that are correlated with low levels of stereotypy. So some of the benefits of non-contingent reinforcement are that it's possible that when we provide access to items that reduce stereotypy, the, stimuli, the stimulus produced by playing with or engaging with those items might be similar to what's produced by engaging in stereotypy. And if that's the case, that item might substitute for stereotypy engagement, which would directly address the function of stereotypy. They're also relatively simple to employ, um, and continuous monitoring is not required, and there's very minimal prerequisite skills needed. So the individual simply needs to be able to manipulate the items that are presented. There are some drawbacks, however, in that um, NCR may interfere with other tasks or activities. So you can imagine, for example, if we have determined that um, through assessment that providing continuous access to music effectively reduces vocal stereotypy, there are probably a number of different settings, for example, group instruction in a classroom, that we can't provide continuous access to stereotypy, or sorry, continuous access to, um, to music. So it may not be appropriate in all situations. Um, and additionally, the procedures for identifying competing items, which is what we're going to talk a little bit about today, can be relatively time consuming. So as, with, as with, is the case with most treatment options, there's a variety of options for treatment and in different situations, different types of treatments might be more effective. Um, so the question then comes, if we're going to use non-contingent reinforcement, how do we determine which, of the, which items are going to most effectively reduce stereotypy? And the answer is conducting a competing items assessment. So the purpose of a competing items assessment is to find those stimuli that are preferred, but that also are associated with low levels of stereotypy. I'm sure that anecdotally, everyone in here who has worked with individuals with autism has observed that sometimes when a person engages with an item, that you may see stereotypy increase a lot, you may see a decrease, or there may be no effect. So our goal is to find those items that decrease stereotypy. So the method I'm going to talk about today for conducting a competing items assessment uses a free operant stimulus preference assessment. There are other ways to identify competing items, and I'll give you some references for those later, but this is what I'm most familiar with, so it's what I'm going to talk about today. So in a free operant stimulus preference assessment where we're looking to identify competing items, one consideration is that we want to make sure we include in the array of items presented of items that produce a variety of sensory consequences. So for example, we may want to include some items that produce um, sound, some items that, produce, that light up, some items that produce a tactile stimulation. We want to make sure we have a variety of things. Uh, and then we simply present all of the items in a free operant assessment and observe both object engagement as well as the occurrence of stereotypy with those objects. I wanted to show you this as just a sample data collection form that we might use for this type of assessment. Unfortunately, the shading 
I'm noticing doesn't show up right here. This bottom row here is shaded um, a darker color, not from your viewpoint though. Um, so this would be an interval data, data recording sheet if we were going to use partial interval recording for the assessment. There's a number of different methods of data collection that can be used. I think this is probably the one that would be most commonly used in practice. So what we might do with this data sheet is we would include a definition for stereotypy. We'd include which object we're watching for and on this data sheet. And then we would simply score for each 10 second interval, for example, a plus if the person engages with the object and a plus if the individual engages in stereotypy. You could use any other symbols, whatever makes sense. I sometimes find it hard to use plus or minus for stereotypy because I think, I feel, anyway, so sometimes we use X's and zeros, whatever, is, whatever makes most sense for um, the people conducting the assessment. And then we would simply record that interval by interval throughout the assessment. And by the end of the assessment, we'll have information about how much stereotypy occurred overall during the assessment how much object engagement occurred with each item in the assessment, and also how much stereotypy occurred with each item in the assessment. And that gives us information for selecting items um, that might decrease stereotypy. I'm just gonna show you, this video is a, um, uh, a video of a free operant stimulus preference assessment that was conducted to identify competing items. And you won't be able to see all of them, but you'll probably notice that um, some of the items light up. There's a tomato that vibrates, and there's, there's a whole bunch of different types of stimuli. We'll just watch a little bit of this. on from that. Uh, so this is a sample graph of what the information we might get from this type of assessment. This graph is uh, from one of the participants in my master's thesis, but I have pared it down and just highlighted the information that's most relevant for what we're talking about in terms of competing item items. So just to orient you, you'll see percentage of time is along the y-axis, and then each of the items assessed is along the x-axis. I'll just draw your attention to the legend. Um, so the gray bars, these ones here, uh, represent stereotypy that occurred with each individual object. So of the time that participant engaged with that object, what percentage of that time did they also engage in stereotypy? And then the black bars uh, show the percentage of time of object engagement with that item. And this hash bar right here um, shows the overall level of stereotypy during the entire session, regardless of what item the person engaged in. So of the full assessment, how much time were they engaged in stereotypy? So the thing that I'll just draw your attention to is this item right here. We would call this item a high preference, low stereotypy item. And it's because the item is the second most preferred in the assessment. It's the one they spent the second most amount of time with. And this level of stereotypy here is much lower than the overall level of stereotypy. So when the participant had this item, the amount of time, the percentage of time they engaged in stereotypy with that item was um, much lower than the overall stereotypy in the session. Does that make sense? It's a little bit of a tricky one to explain. Um, so the other thing that's interesting is look at the most preferred item. The level of stereotypy when he manipulated the most preferred item, the foil blanket, was actually higher than the overall rate of stereotypy. So if you think about if we had just selected a preferred, the most preferred item to use for NCR, we would have been selecting the item that actually increased stereotypy rather than the item that decreased it. So that's why having both of these pieces of information can be useful. So in terms of how this type of information might impact treatment decisions, um, as I mentioned, we can use the high preference, low stereotypy items for non-contingent reinforcement. We can provide it non-contingently to reduce stereotypy. Where this is most useful is in really day-to-day -day life. So for example, if you can imagine a family who has uh, a child who engages in very loud, disruptive vocal stereotypy um, that's quite distressing when, when it occurs over a period of time, um, 
if they engage in that while the parent is preparing dinner, for example, um, it might be possible, and this actually did happen with one of the participants in my study, for them just to provide non-contingent access to music during that time if we know that reduces stereotypy, and that might reduce stereotypy to a low enough rate that it's manageable. Um, and it's also something they can provide access to while they're doing other things. So they would be able to continue to make dinner and hopefully also have lower levels of stereotypy. The other piece to think about is that high stereotypy items can be avoided. Um, so it may be that unknowingly, let's say for example, a student engages in much higher levels of stereotypy when the TV's on. That can, that can happen. And if, for example, that same parent is um, cook, um, making dinner, and like most of us, not a parent, I know this, puts the TV on for their child while they make dinner, and there's very high levels of stereotypy, if we find out that the TV increases stereotypy, then that's really good information for us to have. Don't put the TV on. Let's find something else that's preferred that the child can access during that time. Another good use of this type of assessment, and particularly the data form that I showed you, is using it um, in the context of evaluating toy play and leisure activity instruction. So that data collection form I showed you, let's just see if I can go back to it quickly here. I've used this um, often when I'm doing uh, or intake for a new client. I may, um, for example, look at some leisure items I know they have some experience with, but they don't play with for a long period of time, and observe them for, let's say, two minutes or five minutes, and record engagement in stereotypy and object manipulation. And then that can provide me with a really nice pre-post measure. So once I provided them with instruction in how to use that toy and self-management skills around stereotypy, when I do a post-evaluation, do I then see that levels of stereotypy are lower? So that's just sort of another separate use for the data collection form. So as I mentioned, there are other ways to carry out competing items assessment. Um, a number of different studies have used single stimulus duration-based assessments to evaluate stereotypy, or sorry, to evaluate to find competing items. Um, and what that involves is rather than presenting a number of items all at the same time, you simply present one item for let's say five minutes, observe engagement in stereotypy and manipulation of the object, and then you present the next item for five minutes and observe there. And then you combine, compile the data across objects and that gives you a similar type of hierarchy. Um, so there are some references there, they're also in the reference list if you're interested in taking a look at those. So all the preference assessments we've discussed here have benefits and are effective, but not all are appropriate for every, every client in every situation. Um, so one, of the question that com one question that comes up is how do we determine which, which preference assessment is most appropriate in what situation? And thankfully, someone has written a really nice article that provides us with some information about this. So Karsten Carr and Lepper created a practitioner model for identified preferred, identifying preferred stimuli when working with children with ASD. And I just wanted to share quickly with you the sort of a little bit of the flow chart that they've created um, that's in this article. And I just wanted to kind of highlight it because it's a very, I found it to be a very useful resource. So I won't talk about the whole model, but you can see at the top here, the sort of go-to starting point they have is a multiple stimulus without replacement assessment. And then they have information like, for example, if you're seeing problem behavior when preferred items are removed, move on down to a free operant assessment. If you're seeing a positional bias, think about doing a multiple stimulus without replacement in a toy box where all the items are placed in a box and the child selects from there, um, and so on. So there's a number of different um, uh, different sort of directions that can be taken, and it, it sort of nicely summarizes the uh, considerations when determining which preference assessment to use. Before we sort of draw things to a conclusion, I wanted to bring these questions um, back to the group, now that we've kind of come closer to the end of the presentation, and talk about um, what some of the ways you are that you've used to assess preferences with, your, um, with the clients that you work with. Um, and when you found it challenging, perhaps if there's times you found it challenging to assess preferences, or if throughout this presentation there's ways that you're thinking now you might be able to use a stimulus preference assessment. So just to conclude, um, structured preference assessments can be used to, as we've talked about, identify preferred items, identify um, items that can be used as reinforcers when reducing problem behavior and increasing desirable or alternative behaviors. But I think the key take home piece is that structured preference assessments can also be used for other things. They can also be used um, to inform treatment decisions and to inform the selection of targets, um, treatment settings, and a variety of different other things. And by using them in that way, we provide clients with a voice and a way to have input into their treatment that they might not otherwise have. 
So, just before I wind up, I wanted to provide you with some additional resources in case you're interested. Um, I can send you any of the data collection forms. If you're interested in them, just send me an email. Um, my email's on the next slide. Um, I also wanted to direct you to uh, Western Michigan University's practitioner resources. Um, they have a whole bunch of different practitioner resources, but one of the ones they have is a, um, a great talk on stimulus preference assessments, and it goes much more in-depth into the different types of stimulus assessments, um, stimulus preference assessments, than I did. And then there's also a past circuit presentation that Dr. Groh um, presented that also goes very much into depth, in depth into the uh, different types of assessments, whereas this presentation was focused more on some different applications of it.